The Knightsbridge Mystery by Charles Reed. Part 4. Ah, scream ye fools, roared Bradbury, that couldn't see a church by daylight. Then, shaking his fist at Cowan, thou villain, tisn't one man you have murdered, tis two. But please God, I'll save one of them yet, and hang you in his place. Way there, not a moment to lose. In another minute, they were all in the yard, and a hackney coach sent for. Captain Cowan said to Bradbury, This thing on my face is choking me. Ah, better than you've been choked, at Tyburn and all. Hang me, don't pillory me. I've served my country. Bradbury removed the wax mask. He said afterward he had no power to refuse the villain. He was so grand and gentle. Thank you, sir. Now what can I do for you? Save Daniel Cox? Ah, do that and I'll forgive you. Give me a sheet of paper. Bradbury, impressed by the man's tone of sincerity, took him into the bar, and, getting all his men round him, placed paper and ink before him. He addressed to General Barrington, in attendance on His Majesty, these general, see His Majesty betimes, tell him from me that Daniel Cox, condemned to die at noon, is innocent, and get him a reprieve. O Barrington, come to your lost comrade. The bearer will tell you where I am. I cannot. Edward Cowan. Send a man you can trust to Windsor with that, and take me to my most welcome death. A trusty officer was dispatched to Windsor, and in about an hour Cowan was lodged in Newgate. All that night Bradbury laboured to save the man that was condemned to die. He knocked up the sheriff of Middlesex, and told him all. "'Don't come to me,' said the sheriff. "'Go to the minister.' He rode to the minister's house. The minister was up. His wife gave a ball, windows blaring, shadows dancing, musics, lights. Night turned into day. Bradbury knocked. The door flew open, and revealed a line of bedesigned footmen, dotted at intervals up the stairs. "'I must see my lord, life or death. I'm an officer from Bow Street.' "'You can't see my lord. Ha is entertaining the petition ambassador and his suite. I must see him, or an innocent man will die tomorrow. Tell him. Here's a guinea. Is there? Step aside here.' He waited in torments till the message went through the gamut of lackeys, and got more or less mutilated to the minister. He detached a Buffett, who proposed to Bradbury to call at the Doolittle office in Westminster next morning. No, said Bradbury, I don't leave the house till I see him. Innocent blood shall not be spilled for want of a word in time. The Buffer retired, and in came a Duffer, who said the occasion was not convenient. Ah, but it is, said Bradbury, and if my lord is not here in five minutes— I'll go upstairs and tell my tale before them all, and see if they are all hairdressers' dummies, without heart or conscience or sense. In five minutes in came a gentleman, with an order on his breast, and said, You are a Bow Street officer? Yes, my lord. Name? Bradbury. You say the man condemned to die tomorrow is innocent? Yes, my lord. How do you know? Just taken the real culprit. When is the other to suffer? Twelve tomorrow. Seems short time. Hmm. Will you be good enough to take a line to the sheriff? Formal message tomorrow? The actual message ran. Delay execution of Cox till we hear from Windsor. Bearer will give reasons. With this Bradbury hurried away, not to the sheriff, but to the prison, and infected the jailer and the chaplain, and all the turnkeys with pity for the condemned, and the spirit of delay. Bradbury breakfasted and washed his face, and off to the sheriff. Sheriff was gone out. Bradbury hunted from pillar to post, and could find him nowhere. He was, at last, obliged to go and wait for him at Newgate. He arrived at the stroke of twelve to superintend the execution. Bradbury put the minister's note into his hand. "'This is no use,' said he. "'I want an order from Her Majesty, or the Privy Council, at least.' "'Not to delay,' suggested the chaplain. "'You have and the day for it. "'All the day. "'I can't be all the day hanging a single man. "'My time is precious, gentlemen.' "'Then, his bark being worse than his bite, he said, "'I shall come again at four o'clock, "'and then, if there is no news from Windsor, "'the law must take its course.' "'He never came again, though, "'for even as he turned his back to retire, 
there was a faint cry from the farthest part of the crowd. A paper raised on a hussar's lance, and, as the mob fell back on every aide, a royal aide de camp rode up, followed closely by the mounted runner, and delivered to the sheriff a reprieve under the sign manual of His Majesty George I. At 2 p.m. of the same day, General Sir Robert Barrington reached Newgate, and saw Captain Cowan in private. That unhappy man fell on his knees and made a confession. Barrington was horrified, and turned as cold as ice to him. He stood erect as a statue. A soldier to rob, said he. Murder was bad enough, but to rob. Cowan, with his head and hands all hanging down, could only say faintly, I have been robbed and ruined, and it was for my boy. Ah, me, what will become of him? I have lost my soul for him, and now he will be ruined and disgraced by me. Who would have died for him? The strong man shook with agony, and his head and hands almost touched the ground. Sir Robert Barrington looked at him and pondered. No, said he, relenting a little, that is the one thing I can do for you. I had made up my mind to take your son to Canada as my secretary, and I will take him, but he must change his name. I sail next Thursday. The broken man stirred wildly, then started up and blessed him, and from that moment the wild hope entered his breast that he might keep his son unstained by his crime, and even ignorant of it. Barrington said that was impossible, but yielded to the father's prayers, and consented to act as if it was possible. He would send a messenger to Oxford, with money, and instructions to bring the young man up and put him on board the ship at Gravesend. This difficult scheme once conceived, there was not a moment to be lost. Barrington sent down a mounted messenger to Oxford with money and instructions. Cowan sent for Bradbury and asked him when he was to appear at Bow Street. Tomorrow, I suppose. Do me a favour. Get all your witnesses. Make the case complete and show me only once to the public before I am tried. Well, Captain, said Bradbury, you are square with me about poor Cox. I don't see as it matters much to you, but I'll not say you nay. He saw the solicitor for the Crown, and asked a few days to collect all his evidence, the functionary named Friday. This was conveyed next day to Cowan, and put him in a fever. It gave him a chance of keeping his son ignorant, but no certainty. Ships were eternally detained at Gravesend, waiting for a wind. There were no steam tugs then to draw them into the blue water. Even going down the channel, Letters boarded them if the wind slacked. He walked his room to and fro, like a caged tiger, day and night. Wednesday evening, Barrington came with the news that his son was at the Star in Cornhill. I have got him to bed, said he, and, Lord forgive me, I have let him think he will see you before we go down to Gravesend tomorrow. Then let me see him, said the miserable father. He shall know naught from me. They applied to the jailer, and urged that he could be a prisoner all the time, surrounded by constables in disguise. No, the jailer would not risk his place and an indictment. Bradbury was sent for, and made light of the responsibility. I brought him here, said he, and I will take him to the star. I and my fellows. Indeed, he will give us no trouble this time. Why, that would blow the gaff, and make the young gentleman fly to the whole thing. It can only be done by authority, was the jailer's reply. Then by authority it shall be done, said Sir Robert. Mr. Bradbury, have three men here with a coach at one o'clock, and a regiment, if you like, to watch the star. Punctually at one came Barrington with an authority. It was a request from the Queen. The jailer took it respectfully. It was an authority not worth a button, but he knew he could not lose his place with this writing to brandish at need. The father and son dined with the general at the Star. Bradbury and one of his fellows waited as private servants. Other officers in plain clothes watched back and front. At three o'clock father and son parted, the son with many tears, the father with dry eyes, but a voice that trembled as he blessed him. Young Cowan, now Morris, went down to Gravesend with his chief, the criminal back to Newgate, respectfully bowed from the door of the Star, by landlord and waiters. At first he was comparatively calm, 
but as the night advanced became restless, and by and by began to pace his cell again like a caged lion. At twenty minutes past eleven a turnkey brought him a line. A horseman had galloped in with it from Gravesend. A fair wind, we weigh anchor at the full tide. It is a merchant vessel, and the captain under my orders to keep off shore and take no messages. Farewell. Turn to the guard you have forgotten. He alone can pardon you. On receiving this note, Cowan betook him to his knees. In this attitude the jailer found him when he went his round. He waited till the captain rose, and then let him know that an able lawyer was in waiting, instructed to defend him at Bow Street next morning. The truth is, the females of the Swan had club money for this purposes. Cowan declined to see him. I thank you, sir, he said. I will defend myself. He said, however, he had a little favour to ask. I have been, said he, of late much agitated and fatigued, and a sore trial awaits me in the morning. A few hours of unbroken sleep would be a boon to me. The turnkeys must come in to see you are all right. It is their duty, but I will lie in sight of the door if they will be good enough not to wake me. There can be no objection to that, Captain, and I am glad to see you calmer. Thank you. Never calmer in my life. He got his pillow, set two chairs, and composed himself to sleep. He put the candle on the table, that the turnkeys might peep through the door and see him. Once or twice they peeped in very softly, and saw him sleeping in the full light of the candle, to moderate which, apparently, he had thrown a white handkerchief over his face. At nine in the morning they brought him his breakfast, as he must be at Bow Street between ten and eleven. When they came so near him, it struck them he lay too still. They took off the handkerchief. He had been dead some hours. Yes, there, calm, grave, and noble, incapable, as it seemed, either of the passions that had destroyed him, or the tender affection which redeemed yet inspired his crimes, lay the corpse of Edward Cohen. Thus miserably perished a man in whom were many elements of greatness— he left what little money he had to Bradbury, in a note imploring him to keep particulars out of the journals for his son's sake, and such was the influence on Bradbury of the scene at the star, the man's dead face, and his dying words, that, though public detail was his interest, nothing transpired but that the gentleman who had been arrested on suspicion of being concerned in the murder at the Swan Inn had committed suicide to which was added by another hand. Cox, however, was the king's pardon, and the affair still remained shrouded with mystery. Cox was permitted to see the body of Cowan, and whether the features had gone back to youth, or his own brain, long sobered in earnest, had enlightened his memory, recognised him as a man he had seen committed for horse-stealing at Ipswich, when he himself was the Murr's groom but some girl lent the accused a file, and he cut his way out of the cage. Cox's calamity was his greatest blessing. He went into Newgate scarcely knowing there was a god. He came out thoroughly enlightened in that respect, by the teaching of the chaplain and the death of Cowan. He went in a drunkard. The noose that dangled over his head so long terrified him into lifelong sobriety, for he laid all the blame on liquor, and he came out as bitter a foe to drink as drink had been to him. His case excited sympathy. A considerable sum was subscribed to set him up in trade. He became a horse-dealer, on a small scale, but he was really a most excellent judge of horses, and, being sober, enlarged his business, horsed a coach or two, attended fairs, and eventually made a fortune by dealing in cavalry horses under government contracts. As his money increased, his nose diminished, and when he died, old and regretted, only a pink tinge revealed the habits of his earlier life. Mrs. Martha Cust and Barbara Lamb were no longer sure, but they doubted to their dying day the innocence of the ugly fellow, and the guilt of the handsome, civil-spoken gentleman. But they converted nobody to their opinion, for they gave their reasons. 